Hey, everyone. Last session of the day. Thank you for making it to this one. Yeah, hello and welcome. And yeah, thanks for, for coming out. Uh, There's actually a lot more people than we expected for the end of the day. So I think the format we're going to do, we're going to run through what we have observed with over 125 portfolio companies. And uh, we would like to save some time for some Q&A uh, towards the end. So let's go ahead and start. So Blizzard has invested in over 125 ventures uh, since we started the fund in November 20, uh, 2021. That's about two per week on average. Uh, that's a tremendous pace, a lot of companies that, uh, that we've worked with, and we're not throwing money around. We do deep diligence, we do deep uh, KYC, we do deep uh, uh, legal review of every single deal. So there's a lot that we see, a lot that we've seen in the past year and a half or so, and happy to share a couple of observations uh, and elaborate on things that, that we've seen. We kind of divided those into uh, uh, three categories for you today. First one, observations on venture capital itself. Then uh, we could talk about some uh, uh, observations around entrepreneurs and uh, entrepreneurship. And then uh, the Web3 market in general. So we'll jump right in. First observation here is that uh, uh, from a venture capital point of view, investment instruments are often misused. Uh, and we'll go through a couple of those. Essentially, uh, uh, safes are often overused. Uh, SAFs are not simple. And uh, common stock is something that we occasionally see but don't like. Uh, specifically, uh, safes first. So safes are a, a very easy way for uh, entrepreneurs to raise money. They're intended for very early stage companies and generally not large raises or later stage. And uh, we see them a lot. Uh, and they're not always appropriate for those, uh, those later stage companies. They uh, don't give the investor very much protections. Um, and although they're easy to execute on, on, uh, on the entrepreneur side, uh, for an investor, it, it doesn't tell you that much. It doesn't give you that much. Yeah, and the other instrument that we may have heard about a lot in Web3 is the SAFT, or the Simple Agreement for Future Tokens. And this instrument has evolved over time, and it's modeled after the SAFE. Uh, unfortunately, it is not standardized. There is no template for a SAFT, and it actually varies depending on the law firm that you use, the region that you're in, and similar to what a SAFE does, it really just promises that at some point in the future, the investor has the option to convert the purchase amount of that agreement into tokens. And what ultimately ends up happening is that in the agreement, the investor has to waive a lot of rights, has to give up a lot of protections that just aren't in what we have in traditional financial agreements. Uh, you know, it's not that it's not a good instrument, it's just that this instrument does have to evolve. And at the same time, until we have a little bit more regular, regulatory clarity or standardization across many different countries, all of the agreements look very different depending on what country that it is governed in. So, you know, it's, it's pretty standard in the industry, but again, it's standard as a instrument that you're buying, but the actual language within each contract is very different. Uh, another point there, uh, which I won't go into too much depth, is around uh, common stock. So when a company is finally doing a, a more formal offering, we have occasionally seen some offer uh, common stock instead of preferred stock. As uh, venture investors, this doesn't provide any of the, the protections uh, that, uh, that are needed uh, to help protect the investment that's being made. More importantly, uh, on valuations. Um, valuations are often not well thought out, uh, and we've certainly seen this across, across many. And really what you need to do is uh, evaluate what the company uh, will likely need to raise in the future. Uh, reserve some space for that, understand what the investors need in order to uh, get out of the investment at some point in the future, uh, and make sure that there can be proper incentivization and proper return for everybody that's involved on both sides. Uh, one great way to do this is actually work with, uh, with investors instead of trying to, to set something yourself, uh, work with an investor to try to figure out how, what a valuation should be or what the cap in a safe note should be. 
uh, trust them, uh, they've seen a lot, um, and uh, uh, take the input from others. And then on this final point, this is kind of more a message for uh, other investors as well, but the, the idea of avoiding FOMO or don't, don't actually fear missing out. One of the things that we try to do, you know, the mandate of Blizzard as an avalanche ecosystem fund is to seed the ecosystem with growth and really drive adoption of avalanche. And sometimes you do really need to do deep diligence to understand what the founder is trying to build, what the utility of the project is, and what the future or existing kind of addressable market of the project is. And that takes time. And sometimes, you know, as we saw in the last cycle, if there is a lot of exuberance, a lot of hype, and you kind of just want to be there, and as we've seen in, in, as we kind of come into this bear market, a lot of those really hyped projects are suffering or floundering, and I think we've been able to sidestep a lot of it because of the diligence that we've done. So not so much as a point for founders on this one, but you know, it's something to think about as well. Couple of uh, observations on uh, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. Uh, clear communications, uh, something that's, that's very important. We really, we have our formal methodologies for evaluating investments. We look at the, uh, the people, we look at the opportunity, we look at the context, what's happening in the industry, we look at the deal numbers. But really, fundamentally, what we're looking for uh, as investors, as people who can clearly communicate their ideas. Um, Lydia, a little more on that? Yeah, you know, a lot of this also comes back to relationships and making sure that your communications with, as a founder, with your investors and as an investor with your portfolio companies, um, a really strong relationship and a lot of support, especially here at Blizzard, because we work so closely with the Ava Labs team as well, to really support the portfolio companies with, with resources beyond financial capital, is that we really need to understand what your team is trying to build and what resources your team needs to really grow and succeed. And if there isn't clear communication of what those needs are or what your goals are, it's very hard for us as an investor to really support that. So that can potentially claw, cause a lot of tension, a lot of friction. So clear communication, one of the most critical, critical skills of a founder, one, to communicate your vision, and, and also to maintain really good relationships. Persistence and follow through is absolutely required. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, we see a lot of deals, we invest in a lot of deals, we receive an enormous amount of, uh, of incoming communications. Uh, and in fact, I just uh, checked my phone before coming up here. I currently have over 300 uh, Telegram mentions just from today. So uh, a lot to go through. I generally try to read 100% of what comes in. Uh, I certainly don't have the opportunity to respond to everything with, uh, with deep thoughts, but really try to, try to get back to people. Um, but it often requires uh, persistence of, of entrepreneurs. Uh, that really helps, like uh, keep, keep asking the question, keep following up. Uh, it's not just that I'm, I'm ignoring you, I'm almost never ignoring you, it's just that I need to know what's the most important thing to respond to. Uh, characteristics of great entrepreneurs, kind of coming back to the clear communications, I think one of the things I said was being able to communicate your vision. And one of the things, kind of building on that, we love meeting with founders uh, who have a really clear vision of what they're trying to build. It can be a very long road, it can be a very far road. In fact, it could even be a bad idea. Frankly, it doesn't have to be a good idea, but if you have a vision for what you're doing and you have an idea of how you're gonna get there, it is much easier to work with a team that has that North Star. Even if it's a bad idea, as a founder, you can keep going and keep going until you come up with a good idea. But if you don't know where you're going, you can't figure out what you're building. And that's, that's something that is you know, one of the characteristics that I definitely look for. Josh, do you have anything on this? Uh, coachability is probably the, the thing that I uh, think is very important for people. Not, no, nobody knows everything. Uh, you have to be able to listen to, to experts, to people who have done things before. Um, I certainly don't know everything, uh, even after being a, a founder uh, four times uh, with a couple of acquisition exits, one IPO exit, uh, and also a crash and burn within six months. 
So uh, uh, I've seen many things. I don't know everything that there is out there that's going to happen, but really want uh, a good entrepreneur to listen, to uh, listen to lessons from others. On the Web3 market. Going back to topic about valuation, you know, markets often end up being more important, especially in, a, in, in an industry like ours where we're still very early. Um, you know, the fundamentals and, and utility and what your vision is as a founder is very important, but sometimes when the market isn't moving in your favor, you kind of have to just pick up where you are and do the best with what the market is willing to give you. And that's very frustrating um, at times, but you know, that's kind of understanding where we are in the cycle is very critical to the path forward and how you're gonna fundraise. Um, you know, we've, back in, back in a year and a half ago, two years ago, you know, we saw plenty of projects that had no code written, absolutely nothing, trying to go out at 100 million, a uh, fully diluted valuation. And, you know, we're trying to understand, like, where are we going from there? And at the peak, it was even as high as 200 million. And kind of combining that with avoiding FOMO, you know, those, those deals are not getting shopped around anymore. But that's not to say that you know, the projects that we're seeing at a lower valuation are not necessarily good projects. A lot of them are. Uh, and then you just have to really continue to keep your head down as investors and do the diligence and find the really good teams. But as a founder, you kind of have to understand where we are in the cycle and work with your investors to, to pick, to build the best structure for you. As somebody who's come from a, a different ecosystem, uh, prior to this, which shall go unnamed for right now, uh, the Avalanche ecosystem is really fantastic. Uh, people are really working together. People really want to work hand in hand. Uh, previously, uh, the ecosystem I was working with was a lot more uh, closed and competitive. Projects were really competitive with each other. And really what we're seeing, what we've all seen over the past couple of days here, um, is the, the incredible community, the incredible uh, ecosystem. And I'm really uh, grateful to, uh, to be a part of it and to uh, uh, help it grow and thrive. I just added you know, Thank you all for being here. I mean, that's the final, the community has made of everybody here and everybody who's been in Barcelona today. So I would say I've been, in, been a part of Baba Labs for three years and I would agree, the ecosystem is amazing. And o overall, we've certainly um, noticed with all the, the great opportunities that we've seen and all the people that, uh, that we've met that we're still in the early stages of adoption here. There are a lot of great things to be built. Uh, there are a lot of people building great things, but there are still a lot of opportunities to help expand the universe, uh, to help expand the pie, to help expand who's working uh, in this space uh, and, uh, and the things that are possible with, uh, with this technology. I think for any builder who's been in Web3, we understand that on-ramping and bringing the next, as people like to say, the next 1 billion users to Web3 is extremely difficult with the user experience that we have, and there's just a lot of friction and onboarding. So we've seen a lot of projects, and we're very excited about the teams that are addressing the onboarding problem from the outset. And this is easier for specific verticals over others, but you know, a lot of gaming teams are trying to make gaming uh, more typical of the traditional Web2 gaming experience where either you can just pick up the game and start playing like a free-to-play mobile game or you can just have um, a login tied to you know, some kind of open auth login, like a social login, and, or, and then they can create the wallet later. Basically, like, hook the user and then make it a really simple experience to provide them with the wallet. It could be custodial to start, but if if the person has an easy place to refer to their assets and maybe not even realize that they're NFTs, as an example, you know, these are, these are the problems that will really bring mass adoption. And frankly, you know, on a, any given day, there are fewer than a million users in Web3 sometimes. So, so it's something that we really have to address right now to get to the next part of the adoption curve. And uh, we, we are continuing to invest. 
Um, there are, there's a lot of opportunity out there. So uh, please be in touch with us if you uh, know some businesses or if you're looking at building yourself. We launched a blizzard.fund website, which has a, uh, an inventory of uh, the 125 plus companies that we've invested in. Uh, please feel free to take a look there. And if there are any that you want to connect with or that you think are doing some great things, we're happy to put you in touch with them. Well, we have five minutes left, so if there are any questions, uh, we're happy to take them right there. It's oh. <laughs> <laughs> a good question, Eric. Josh? <laughs> it's a limited edition, but I've received a lot of requests for, uh, for these, so we'll see what we can do. So uh, I don't know if you're more focused on late stages or uh, pre-seed and early stages. But um, how important is it for uh, an early stage company to know what they're doing when they're trying to uh, gather some funds so understand what they can give to the venture capital uh, or what uh, they should um, ask or how much they're worth? all of the, these things, how important is it to know them if you're a very early stage company? Well, I can start with the, you know, Blizzard actually invests primarily in seed and kind of series A type stages, so all of our founders are very early. Uh, we do have a handful of later stage companies, later stage meaning like series B, not like, not like growth equity, uh, but you know, we do find that the founders who have a clear vision of where they're going, and we're not saying that they have to have built much, but if you're able to communicate where you're going and you can lay out the roadmap to say, we're gonna get to this, and we're gonna have this milestone set for this round, and then we'll, this will give us enough runway to get to the next milestone, at which point we'll raise the next round, and then each milestone will get you to what your final product looks like. And that can evolve over time. Like the roadmap doesn't stay steady. Uh, but you know, it and then in terms of like setting what your valuation is, it, if you're an early stage company, it's probably too early to be thinking of like an actual number or a price round, right? That's kind of where we talk about the safe. Um, we can also do a SAF if that's a token, if you're primarily doing a token round. Uh, but Josh? And with, with early stage companies, we expect that you will adapt to the market. We expect that you will change, that the, the initial vision that you sent out will, uh, that you set out will, will stay the same, but the way that you get there will be different than, than how you started, and that's okay. And we've seen plenty of, of pivots, uh, many of them successful uh, so far, and uh, that's okay. It's okay to adapt. Up front over here. Hey, thanks, uh, Lydia and Josh, for, for this last uh, very inspirational speech. And uh, you guys talk a little bit about the uh, valuation just now, also in the in the presentation. That uh, working with investor is it uh, only applies to the to the case that you guys are leading, or it applies to every case? Like, how how, how should we? Uh, how, how delicate should we be in working with you guys on the valuation? Because that's kind of vague, no? Um, with valuations, it's certainly a, uh, an art, not a science. Um, and it's, it's a matter of just having some conversations about laying out some initial parameters. Here's what we, here's what we think we need now. Here's what we think we might need in the future. Um, and how do we make sure that we have enough here to uh, align the incentives of both the, the, the founding team as well as the, um, as well as the investors. So there's certainly no magic formula there and it's, uh, it's ever evolving. It's also helpful to talk to your, your investors, your potential investors who have a good pulse on the market itself. Um, what, uh, what others are being valued at, what other comparables might make sense here. Um, so a, a lot of inputs and uh, and uh, it's uh, have that conversation. Hi, thank you. So we are uh, sort of for monkeying. We're actually looking for uh, investments. We are in a uh, privacy infrastructure as a service, and uh, what's the timeline when? 
to like get the funds? Is it like a one month, two months, or like eight weeks since you decide like, okay, yes, we're going forward? Um, to you mean to have that first conversation and close and get, yeah. Well, for, we can speak to our experience, but uh, uh, you know, for us, because of the diligence process, we do go pretty deep with our teams. I think the, while well, this is the average, I would say is anywhere like eight weeks and up, like at big, best. Big standard deviation. Yeah, there is, yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, for any team who's looking to put together a round, to be cognizant of just generally these longer cycles, and you know, before, uh, before founders are kind of thinking about their next round, you know, have that in mind, like you should also think about what you need to build and then add a few months to that <laughs> and, and really start structuring it very early on. We don't know if that helps, but you know, the process takes longer generally for us. It, it always takes longer than you expect. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so add in that padding. But, um, but you know, we're, we're still able to do a, a great deal of volume uh, and find some really great companies um, and, uh, and do that sort of deep research and deep connection. That's really what, what we're looking for. And uh, what's being built here in this community is fantastic. And we love, uh, love being able to support the companies that we do. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. I want to ask you what's your, your experience by investing in tokens after these 125 companies. What things would you do different and what are your learnings on, on that? I think one of the key differences of investing in tokens versus equity is that the liquidity comes much faster. Uh, you know, usually venture funds have a horizon of anywhere from like five to seven years, probably more in some cases. Uh, with tokens, especially if it's a DeFi project, you know, the time to market just happens to be much faster, and the token generation event will happen in a number of months as opposed to years. So, you know, the vesting schedules also take, you know, it's usually like linear over, over a year or two for investors. So the difference is literally the fact that, you know, you get your tokens faster, um, you know, and then you get to actually use them with the protocol and be a, be a client, be a customer, you know, as, and a stakeholder beyond just being an investor. Um, there was another part to that question. But when, yeah. when you want to close, for instance, your position as an investor, maybe you feel the perfect uh, that because you make a big jump in the token price, or how was the experience, or for instance, that the, the, the way the perfect uh, fit, the token wasn't not very aligned with the users, how does one actually not fit the leverage? I don't know that there's a generalization we can make, but we're, we have sort of a unique structure um, as Blizzard where we, um, we're not always trying to maximize the, the dollar output. We're not trying to dump tokens or sell them immediately. We actually uh, can distribute back to our investors in kind, so with those tokens. And we'll often make some mention about what, uh, what utility those tokens have or what things people can do with them. Um, we, in general, try uh, uh, aim, aim to hold um, and uh, have had some exciting utility out of things that we've already seen. I think we're, uh, we're at the end of time. One more. Oh, okay. oh sorry, up here. Uh, so maybe you could reframe this question uh, a little better. But, you know, comparing the Web3 market to the, maybe the traditional VC market, obviously on the traditional side, we're maybe in, in a time of reoccurring revenue being the most important piece or being able to really see that revenue runway be an important deciding factor. You know, how, how do you feel you, user growth, you know, going all in for user growth at the cost of chasing revenue or, or, or are you guys looking at, at revenue as the most important factor now as well? Depends on the business, certainly. I, I like to see um, uh, real, not so much real revenue, but some, some company that's been through the whole process of attracting a customer and having uh, a made revenue or generated revenue from that, uh, from that process. They can see things end to end. That's more important, even if it's a dollar of revenue, um, than any particular metric for me in terms of uh, maturity of that. 
Yeah, I think for me, you know, one of the, in addition to what Josh said, you know, Web3 and using blockchain really allows for new revenue models, and it might not necessarily be, you know, a straight up recurring revenue model where it's like a SaaS or subscription model, but, uh, you know, a couple of different portfolio companies that, you know, like Anzilla and Shrapnel, you know, at the core of it, they are not going, they're effectively allowing their players to play for free, but they're using the secondary market and the game economy to drive revenues from there. And frankly, those models haven't really been tried before, right? That's gonna be completely secondary market volume. And we're excited to see what it means, but you know, no one has a clear prediction on that, but we're still going to take a deep look and, and not to say, you know, we're gonna say no just because there isn't a clear revenue stream. We're very, we're very excited to see what they're gonna build and we did invest in them. That's, that's a great point uh, and also a good one to, add, to end on as well, that uh, we, we love these new economic models, new things that haven't been tried, new ways to incentivize users, uh, new revenue models such as haven't been tested or we're not even sure will work. We love those experiments and we'd like to see how they work out. So we're a lot less looking at that and more excited about what, uh, what cool things are being built and what experiments we can, uh, we can assist with and help make successful. I think that's time, and thanks for spending your last session with us today. Thank you, everyone.